any minute now we'll start Thank you for waiting patiently while we sort out all the technical things. Okay. Miriam Jones, Pension Detia, Onya Malestela, Yam Gazitare, Anglia, Poya Toy Naturan, Per Duviet, a juice. My father, Catamenges, Dot of Flas, and Anglish, but in no one to spray him near me ship. Um, so, for anyone who doesn't speak Albanian, um, my name is Alice Taylor, I'm a journalist from England and I've been living in Tirana for two and a half years. Um, I'm going to speak in English this morning because my Albanian is not quite up to the level where I can express myself how I want to do. So, the um, topic of this morning is underdog um, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about for the next 20-25 minutes or so. Now, as I said, I'm from England um, and I was born in the south of England in a place called Cornwall. Uh, now, over the years, I've lived in a number of different countries before settling in Albania, quite by accident, but we'll get to that a bit later. Now, you might quite rightly be wondering what on earth a British person is doing sitting here today talking about being an underdog. I mean, after all, I'm white, British, educated, I have a strong passport and plenty of privilege. Whether that's something I like or not, that's the situation I was born into. You might also think that I couldn't possibly know what it's like to be an underdog. Um, but when I was asked by the organisers of Creative Morning what I thought of the title underdog, what I immediately thought of was a personal battle, an, in, an internal battle, not a battle with society or those around me. Um, you see, I'm someone who believes that the only thing that really holds us back in our lives is attitude and the way that we go about things. Um, now, bearing this in mind, I think there's not much that we can't overcome if we really put our minds to it. And again, I think some of the biggest battles that we face are actually within ourselves. So that's why I'm here today, to talk to you about how I went from being a self-diagnosed underdog to a self-determined top dog in the context of my work as a creative. Um, so, here we are, embarrassing photo time. Now, on paper, uh, my childhood was what you would call idyllic. I grew up in a house in the countryside, surrounded by animals, nature, a lake, just a stone's throw from the sea. Uh, my mother was a teacher and she encouraged me to be creative. And from the age of four, I played the violin, the piano, I wrote, I painted, I read books. Um, that's all I did. I wasn't interested in television or anything like that. Um, but there was a darker side to, to my childhood. Now, this is not something that I'm telling you for sympathy or because I want you to go, oh no, poor Alice, how terrible. I have nothing to gain from anyone's sympathy, but it's an integral part of my story. Um, so my, my father was very violent um, when I was growing up, very abusive, and um, he told me when I was about six years old that the reason he was like it was because I was unplanned as a child. I was a mistake, if you will. And I was six the first time I heard this, and it was something that was repeated to me many times throughout my life. Um, as you can imagine, that has quite a profound impact on a child. Um, now, the way that this manifested in my thinking as I got older was that I didn't have a place, I didn't fit in, um, and that this was due to the fact that I wasn't planned. So when bad things happened to me or around me, I thought, ah, that's because I was a mistake and I wasn't wanted and I'm not meant to be here. 
Now, this is something that really stuck with me as I got older. Now, when I reached the age of 17, I packed my bags. I had enough. Um, I packed my bags and I went to Bristol. Uh, Bristol is a large city in the UK, which was about 200 kilometres from where I was born. Um, I enrolled in a local college, I proceeded to study, um, I got my qualifications and I funded my own way while working um, and studying full time. Now all the time that I was doing this, I was still plagued by this very strong feeling of not fitting in. I did well in school but I wasn't top of the class. I had friends but I wasn't popular. I felt the whole time that when I was successful I was sort of an imposter and I've struggled very much to find the right direction that I wanted to go in. As I got older, this, this feeling of not belonging or not knowing where I was going in life had a very negative effect. So I drank too much, I partied too late, I neglected my studies, and I even passed up good opportunities that came my way just because I didn't think that I was good enough or capable enough to do them. Now, one of my re main reoccurring memories for as long as I can remember is thinking, what am I going to do with my life? Where will I be in one year, five years or 10 years? Now, most of my friends had their lives mapped out already. They knew what they were going to study, what job they were going to go into, when they were going to buy a house, have children, get married, you know. Um, but when I looked ahead, all I could see was a blank space. Uh, there was nothing. I didn't know where I was going to be in a month or a year, let alone five years. Now, looking back now, I think, oh, I was so young, you know, it's, it seems inconsequential. But at the time, not knowing who I was or where I was going, but existing in this world which pressures you to know where you're going, it was a huge burden for me to carry. So I, um, I felt mediocre. I, I think that's the only word I can think of to describe it. I felt mediocre at work, mediocre in the studies, mediocre to look at, medium, mediocre amongst my friends and my peers. I didn't fit into any sort of category. Um, and as a result, I kind of gave up and stopped trying. Perhaps the, the real darkness of these years of my life is not, maybe I'm not able to communicate it very well, but I can't stress it enough. I genuinely thought that I had no future and that this was predetermined because I wasn't wanted. Um, and there were many times I wanted to give up completely. Now, after I finished studying, I remembered feeling even more confused. Did I want to study law? Did I want to be a lawyer? Did I want to spend the rest of my life in an office? I wasn't sure. Uh, so one day, feeling that I needed some time to think and having the opportunity to do so, I jumped on a plane to Malta, alone. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Malta is a tiny little island in the south of the Mediterranean. Now, it was my intention just to spend a couple of weeks there to enjoy the sun, to party, and then to try and figure out what my next move would be. I ended up staying for 10 years. Now, some time later, I ended up getting a job with a rather prestigious law firm. I was working in the marketing department, um, and I couldn't believe that they'd hired me. Hired me. Again, I felt like this imposter, um, like a fraud, like I was sort of lying to them, you know? I felt like I shouldn't be there, and I was sort of waiting for the time when I would inevitably fail. Now, I had a few good years there. I worked my way up. I, I did well in, in various projects and tasks that I was given. But after some time, depression began to descend upon me. I started missing work. I started missing deadlines. I started becoming distracted. I started becoming irritated with the people I worked with. I started dreading going into work every day and the standards of my work of my work was slipping and I knew it. So preempting the inevitable, I decided to quit and I moved to another firm. I thought perhaps some new surroundings would inject some confidence and motivation into me. Now at this time I was working in marketing, so I was doing content creation, web content. I was doing legal analysis for international publications. I was writing articles on legal news and developments for the partners. 
Now, through my work with the firm, I started writing for the local newspaper. Um, I was writing articles of a legal nature on sort of recent developments and interesting things that were going on in local and international law. Um, now, this led to me building up something of a rapport with the editors of the newspaper. And they impressed, they, um, they, they asked me if I wanted to write content for them, if I wanted to submit a couple of articles um, myself. Oh, oh dear, the slides have gone a bit funny there. Hold on, I knew a, I knew a technical hitch was going to happen. They asked me if I wanted to write for them. Um, now, this came at a good time because at this new law firm, I was getting stressed again because the demons that I had inside me were coming out and I was thinking, I'm not good enough. I don't know if this is the path for me. I'm destined to fail. Um, and the fact that I was in this great job, you know, that many people dream of and I wasn't happy made me even more stressed. So this, this opportunity came at a good time. So they asked me to write a couple of articles um, for them and just to submit them on topics that I was interested in. And I thought, why does anyone care what I have to say? Why, why on earth would anyone waste time reading my articles under my name? Um, why would they be interested? And how could anything I write have any kind of impact? But the, um, the writer, the, the editors twisted my arm. Um, so I submitted a couple of articles on women's rights, the migration crisis, various things like this. Um, now the articles were a hit. Uh, they got loads of views, loads of shares, the editors were really happy. And a couple of months later, the paper offered me my very own column. Now this was very exciting for me. Um, I became a proper columnist with this newspaper and I felt ever so proud of, of this achievement. Um, at this point, I came under the supervision of a female journalist called Daphne Caruana Galizia. And she was an idol of mine. She was an investigative reporter and a political columnist. She was sharp-witted, clever, blunt, daring, and she followed the political stories that no one else would. She was the only person in Malta at the time who was really unearthing political scandals and holding people relentlessly to account. Now, I began to tackle more controversial, complex topics through my column. Um, now, when you start writing about uh, controversial and complex issues, the inevitable result is getting lashed back in the form of hatred and trolls, especially when you're a woman on the internet. Now, I looked at how Daphne dealt with this sort of criticism she got being a prominent, controversial female voice, and I, I followed her lead. I ignored it. I read her work, I published more of my own, my confidence grew, and I was no longer scared to be judged or singled out. Um, and bit by bit, I began to think, oh, my words are having an impact. But something else was happening to me. I began to notice that when I typed, the words just flood out of me. There's no real process around me thinking something and then, oh, how shall I word it? Da -da -da. It's like my brain and my fingers are directly connected and I sometimes think I can express myself through the written word quicker than I can if I speak. Um, I realised that I loved writing and it was that moment I decided I wanted to be a journalist and a writer. Meanwhile, at work, I was, I was suffering. Um, I remember sitting on the bus on the way to work one day and Looking out the window, it was raining, my shoes were wet, it was grey, it was cold. And I just looked out the window and I looked around the bus at the people around me and I thought, is this what the rest of my life is going to be like? Am I going to sit on a bus every day, work in an office nine to five, make small talk with people I don't like over the coffee machine? Am I going to have to fake smile my way through company events and dread the alarm going off every single day? Am I going to be living, waiting for the weekend? You know, is, is this what the next 40 years are going to be like? Now, the thought of that filled me with absolute dread, and I couldn't bear to consider that this was the future. And this was really getting me down. 
um, more so than I already was, if that was even possible. So I spoke to one of my colleagues who, or an ex-colleague who was an occupational therapist, and he'd been something of a mentor to, to me and sort of given me advice and helped me out from time to time. And I said, I'm worried. I don't want to spend the rest of my life like this. I'm getting really depressed. I'm going to end up in this circle of failing and then trying again and failing. And it's not how I want to live my life. And he said, Alice, find something that you love doing. Find something you're good at. Figure out how to make money out of it and do it. So I did. I quit my job. Um, I packed my desk and I left my office. Oh, here we go, the slideshow being crazy again. There we go, one moment. So, yeah, I packed up my desk, packed up my office, and I walked out of work. Now, my colleagues thought I was crazy. My mother thought I was absolutely, had lost the plot. I was leaving a well-paid job in a great company. I had zero savings, no plan of action just the idea that I wanted to be a freelance writer and a journalist. In fact, um, having always had a company computer before, I didn't even have my own laptop to write on, um, or the next month's rent, which was a bit of an issue. So you can see I was in a bit of a precarious situation. So I dug out my old iPad, which had a cracked screen, and I started using it to try and find work. I joined several freelancer websites and I applied for hundreds of projects. I answered hundreds of requests for writers. I set up a website as an on online portfolio for my writing and I continued writing my column in the newspaper. Now, at the meantime, because of my experience in a law firm, I thought, OK, I need to find some work doing blogging and content creation for law firms. So. I contacted every single law firm and corporate services agency in the country, every single one. I sent them a message proposing myself as a freelance writer. I included my fee structure when I was available. And then I finished the message with, would you like to come for a coffee to discuss this? The end of that month, so 30 days after I walked out of my job with a broken iPad and no money, 30 days later, after working day and night on my iPad, um, not only did I manage to pay my rent in full, but I paid my expenses, such as food and utilities, and I'd made enough money that first month to buy myself a new laptop to write on. But you know what the best feeling was? And it makes me a bit emotional to, to talk about this. But for the first time in my life, ever, I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. The feeling of achievement to have gone from literally zero and being miserable to sustaining myself was just incredible. I was working for myself on my time, making money for myself. And I stayed motivated by remembering that I never wanted to feel like I had that morning on the bus when I looked out of the window and just felt despair. Now, that was five years ago. Uh, now, since then, I have got clients on every continent. Um, I have clients in Costa Rica. I have clients in America. I have clients in England, all over Europe, Singapore, you name it. These are my legal clients that I write for, um, as well as my journalism um, articles as well, which have been published in multiple languages all over the world. I've had millions of readers in total on, on things I've written um, and I haven't looked back since. And each month I've managed to pay my bills, provide a comfortable life, save money and that's all down to me and my motivation because I wanted something better. It's down to the hard work that I put in and my perseverance and a desire to be better and to be the best at what I do. Now, with my newfound freedom, I decided to travel. Um, obviously, being self-employed, my office is where my laptop is. So I had the freedom to go where I wanted. I decided to go to Cyprus for a while, and that's where the next part of the story takes place. It was October the 16th, 2017, in the afternoon around half past three. And I, my mobile started going crazy, you know, messages and 
all types of notifications. So I picked up my phone, I reached over to read the messages that had come in. And the first one I saw just said, they killed her. And I knew instantly what it meant and who her, she was. Daphne Caruana Galizia had been assassinated in, uh, after someone placed a bomb underneath her car. So my inspiration, someone I looked to, the person, the very person who really inspired me to become a journalist had been killed, blown up. She got in a car, in her car, which was outside her house. She drove down the road, 200 metres from her home. The car was, the bomb was detonated via a mobile phone exploded the car was launched into a nearby field her son heard the explosion and ran barefoot and he was the first person on the scene she was killed in instantly you can imagine what sort of effect this this has on someone to lose a colleague uh, an inspiration my world collapsed for a moment of days i was scared i was lost and being a journalist and one with quite a controversial reputation i feared for myself and for my family People knew where I lived. Um, and this was something that really, and also just the brutality of what had happened. I mean, it was hard to understand how someone could do such a thing. We knew who was behind it. We still know who's behind it. The government in Malta, the businessmen linked to government, um, a group of them came together, they planned it, and they got some small time middlemen to place the bomb under the car. But of course, the government were going to make it as hard as possible for justice to be served. And justice would mean most of them being locked behind bars. Um, they consistently stalled the investigation. They levied ta attacks against the set trolls on journalists, myself included, and the other portal I was working for at the time. They corrupted the courts and judiciary to stall the investigation. They controlled the police. A lot of money exchanged hands. And us as journalists who were fighting for the truth to come out, were targeted. Uh, they cracked down on the free media in Malta and made our already very difficult job even more difficult. Now I had two choices at this point. I could stop being a journalist and I could focus on my legal writing. Legal writing is lucrative and there's very little reason for someone to want to put a bomb onto your car when you're writing legal analysis. Or I could do my best to dedicate myself and my work to her memory, to continue her work, to campaign for justice, to campaign for media freedom, and to campaign against corruption. Um, there are days I still wonder if I made the right choice, because being a journalist can be very scary. You fear repercussions and retaliation every time you press publish. You wonder, you've always got sort of one eye over your shoulder. Um, but what I found is people hate those that have no fear and those that are not afraid to tackle controversial subjects. Journalism is not a, not a profession that you make friends in because the louder you speak, the more people try to silence you. But yes, I decided that I should continue. Now, during this time, I found myself in Albania. I'd come for a three-day visit. All right. I'd come for a three-day visit this visit turned into three weeks, and that then turned me into booking a return flight um, and coming back with all of my possessions and my two cats. It's now three cats, but it was two at the time. To cut a very long story short, because how I arrived in Albania is a whole different talk, I'd fallen in love with the country. To this day, I still have no idea what exactly it was that drew me here and what kept me here. But now I cannot think of any other place in the world I would rather be than here. So this was December 2017. By this time, I'd solved two of the biggest problems that had plagued my life since I was seven years old. And my father told me I wasn't wanted and there was no place for me. One, I knew what my purpose in life was. I was meant to be a writer, I was meant to be a journalist. Two, I knew where I was meant to be. I was meant to be a journalist and a writer in Albania. Now, people often ask me, in fact, it's the number one most asked question. Um, I was thinking of getting my answer printed sort of on a t-shirt. Why Albania? 
Um, and I hate that my answer sounds so cliche, but it's true. The truth is that for my entire life, I've been searching for the house, street, city, town, country that would make me feel like home. I'd lived in three other different countries. I'd been looking for somewhere where I could feel like myself and feel like I belonged. Now, finally, and I don't know why, I don't know how, but in this small Western Balkan country full of beauty and burdens, I'd found it. I don't know why, but I had. Now, at the same time, I'd found, as I said, my purpose in life, which was writing with passion. Um, another little strange idea I had was to start a blog. I'd never had a blog before in my life. Um, but I had the idea to start a blog just to write about where I was travelling, what I was discovering in Albania. So I did. I started a blog, I thought, oh, I call it the Balkanista. Um, and I thought, okay, the only people that are really going to read this is probably my mother, maybe my at the time boyfriend, now husband. But I was wrong. Um, the first day, I think I got a thousand hits on this website. Now I'm averaging 40,000 visitors a month from all over the world, not just Albania. Now, I'm really proud of that. My blog, which is just a reflection of my life here, the people I meet, the places I go, the food I eat, the opinions I have, the love that I find here, um, this is just a reflection of that. And people want to read it. <laughs> it's taken me to the most wonderful places, to interview the most interesting people, and to experience things that I never thought was possible. Furthermore, it's given me a creative outlet through which I can talk at my heart's content about my home and why I love it. So, go back six, seven years to when I was miserable working as an employee. In six years, I managed to pull myself out of depression. I managed to motivate myself. I managed to find hope. I managed to become a successful freelancer. I managed to transport myself to a country that made me feel like the best version of myself. I created this business focused around people paying me for the words that I write, a concept I still find very strange. And I became successful in campaigning, activism and journalism. And in those six years, I achieved more in the previous 27. <laughs> and more than that, I found happiness. This is a picture of me and my daughter, Dea. My Shiptari Volga. But what was the key to that success? You might say, oh, privilege, language, passport, education. And maybe, yes, it had something to do with that. But I couldn't have achieved what I've achieved if I didn't have a burning desire for change. I didn't want to live the existence of an underdog anymore, a personal, my definition of an underdog, feeling worthless, feeling like I could never succeed. I didn't want that. I wanted to be happy and I wanted to be successful. I wanted to make money from something I loved doing and was good at, and I didn't let anything stand in my way until I'd achieved it. Now, in today's world, as a creative person, you are no longer constrained by borders, nationality, or your background. Because if you're good at something, and it can be digitalized in any way, someone, somewhere, will pay you to do it. You don't need to learn another language, you don't need to move to another country, you don't have to have in-person meetings with people. You can use the internet to promote yourself, set up an online profile for yourself, to contact whoever you want, to show them what you're capable of. You can use the internet to be persistent and keep pushing for more. Look at me. When I sat there with my iPad and I contacted every law firm in the country to offer them my services. And I got clients from it, clients that I still have years and years later. Because I learned very early on in my life that no one is going to hand you your future on a plate. You need to decide what your rock bottom is when you are the underdog, when you can't go any lower, when, you can't, when you've lost all hope. You, you need to decide when that point is. Um, and only when you've reached that point can you set your sights on something more and work towards it with every single ounce of your being. 
As a creative person who can work digitally, you are now more in demand than ever before. People don't want to employ people in offices anymore. People want self-employed, talented, creative individuals who can work by themselves, remotely and on their own time. While the concept of being self-employed is not quite so well known in Albania, it is a totally realistic way of working. By working outside of Albania, virtually, via the internet, you can access a global marketplace where you will be paid international rates for your work, not the going rate in Albania. You just need to go and find it. The work is there. But being a freelancer, being self-employed, is about constantly trying. It's no good spending all of your time working for your existing clients or drinking coffee. You need to be constantly looking for more, constantly hustling, pitching, applying, networking. Because this is the only way that you can ever be sustainable. So 90% of your work is working and another 90%, I know that doesn't even add up, but that's an indication of how much you have to do, another 90% has to be building on your client base. Because I believe that everyone has the strength inside of them to do this. This is not something that I did because I'm special or I'm strong or something like that. This is something everyone can do. Everyone has the ability to self-motivate and to define your own future. You just have to want it enough. If you're not happy with the direction your life is taking, if you feel like the underdog with your friends, your family and your career, only you have the power to change it. It's no good complaining and whinging and moaning about it, saying, oh, my life's terrible, you know, I wish I could do this. Go and do it. Find something you're good at. Find something you love doing and figure out how to make money from it. Then go out and hustle yourself day and night until you find your way. It's the only way you're ever going to drag yourself out of this feeling of being an underdog. Now this kind of success can be achieved by everyone. Okay, regardless of nationality, regardless of background, regardless of any of these other features. You just have to want it because if you really want it, there is absolutely no such thing as underdog. There is only such a thing as top dog. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Um, and I hope that maybe you found some inspiration or wisdom uh, from the talk. Perhaps if you want to um, ask me some questions via the live stream on Instagram or on Facebook. And... I'll be happy to answer them. I'll be online for another five, ten minutes or so if there's anything you'd like to ask me. Thank you very much.